Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiter here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a patient who is in their early teens and they suffer from chronic buildup of um, keratins of dead skin and uh, dry earwax, um, which causes them not necessarily hearing loss, although yeah, they do feel that the hearing is, is impaired, um, but not massively, not significantly. Their main complaint and symptom is actually of psoriasis, so itchiness of the ear. And you can just imagine how itchy it is just by looking at this patient's ear. So they, they suffer from um, superficial otitis externa. So otitis externa is an infection or inflammation of the outer section of the ear. So more namely the outer ear, which is made up of the outermost layer of the eardrum. So the eardrum's three, three membranes thick. The um, lateral membrane, so the membrane facing us, is lined with a, a layer of epidermis skin, the same skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal. The innermost membrane of the eardrum, so the most layer, is uh, the mucosa. So mucosal skin is similar to the skin in the inside of your nose, so it's more moist, secretory. And then the middle layer is a fibrous um, a layer, which that's what gives its eardrum the strength and elasticity and rigidity. Um, and then you've got the ear canal itself, and then you've got the pinna, which is the cartilage on either side of our heads, um, shaped like a satellite dish. So that's the outer ear. The middle ear is made up of uh, the inner membrane, the layer of the eardrum. The three ossicles, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, also known as the malleus, incus, and stapes. And then also the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is... A narrow orifice connecting the middle ear to the back of the nose, the nasopharynx, and that's the pressure equalizing tube in the ear. Because ideally, we want the air pressure behind the eardrum to be equal to the air pressure in the atmosphere. Uh, when the air pressure is equal either side of the eardrum, that's when our eardrum is most mobile and compliant, and that's when we hear the best. Um, the eustachian tube at resting state is actually shut at the back of the nose where it connects there. Uh, but during brief moments of yawning, swallowing, and chewing, muscles either side of the eustachian tube contract, causing the eustachian tube to open. And just during those brief moments when the air pressure can equalise and any fluid accumulation in the middle ear can drain out. And then you've got the inner ear. So the inner ear it consists of the labyrinth. So the labyrinth is um, the organ of hearing, the cochlea. It looks like a snail. And the organ of balance, the vestibular organ, semicircular canals, there's three of them. And so they're all connected um, in a labyrinth shape. And the, it's, it's the smallest bone in the body, the, the stapes bone, so the third of the ossicles, that's connected to the, the cochlea. And contained within the cochlea is inner ear fluid. There's two types, end, uh, endolymph and perilymph. And then you've got uh, two types of hair cells, outer hair cells. So they're involved in the amplification of sounds. And then you've got inner hair cells, which generally process more um, loud input sounds and uh, also help the sound transmission uh, to, the, um, to the brain via the, the eighth cranial nerve, uh, the, also known as the audio vestibular nerve or vestibular cochlear nerve, just different names, but the eighth auditory nerve, that's generally how it's uh, most commonly known. And so when the stapes bone uh, vibrates, so it vibrates with when sound waves enter the ear uh, via the, the ear canal. So the, the, the pinna, let's go back to the front. So the hearing pathway, you've got the pinna, acts like a satellite dish, it captures sound waves, it funnels the sound waves into the ear. These sound waves travel through the ear canal, they hit the eardrum, the eardrum vibrates, these vibrations are transmitted through the ossicles uh, in almost like a pendulum motion. And that causes the, the stapes bone connected to the cochlea to rock backwards and forwards. Um, and those rocking motions cause the fluid within the, the cochlea to travel in waves. Um, and these waves then um, travel over the outer hair cells. And the outer hair cells then shear to one side. And when they shear to one side, they also contract, which then allows... Um, uh, uh, molecules to enter, so um, sodium and potassium, uh, you get a gradient created within the outer hair cell, which then creates uh, what we call an action potential, so electrical current basically, which is transmitted up the auditory nerve to the brain. Um, 
And it doesn't finish there because it's then up to the brain to then process the sound. So um, if you're right-handed, the uh, auditory cortex, uh, well, the part of the brain that processes speech is on the left-hand side hemisphere. And if you're left-handed, it's typically the right side. For musicians, it can, your brain can um, work the opposite way around. So, and the right ear is connected to the left hemisphere of the brain and the left ear is connected to the right hemisphere of the brain. So with regards to speech, that's processed for the for a right-handed, a typical right-handed person in the left hemisphere. So if speech is heard in the right ear, it's directly transmitted to the auditory cortex on the left side, uh, on the left hemisphere. If speech is heard in your left ear, initially it's transported to the right-hand side of the brain, which is more typically involved in processing tones. So for musicians, for example, that part of the hemisphere is very important. Um, uh, but because the brain detects its speech, it then has to be transferred from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere if the sound is heard in the left, the speech is detected in the left ear. And it then tr it travels across the right and left hemisphere via a structure called the corpus callosum. So it's almost like a bridge between the right and left ear. So when the sound reaches the, the, the brain, um, it doesn't end there. So it then has to be transferred to the right part of the brain, whether it's speech or, or tones. And then, of course, the brain's, uh, when it reaches the auditory, auditory cortex, it's then got to process it there. So there's obviously many, there's loads of scope of um, the sound waves or the processing sound not to be efficient along that pathway. Um, so quite often, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, I do uh, see now and again. It's not. It's not often, but I think it is underdiagnosed. Um, patients who suffer from um, conditions called auditory neuropathy or dyssynchrony, and that's where the um, up to the cochlea um, and those little outer hair cells that amplify sound, the hearing system's working okay, but thereafter. Um, the auditory nerve uh, that may not be firing as it should be. So if you think about the auditory nerve like an electrical cable you've got at home, um, and so with, with electrical cables, you've got the wiring inside and you've got a, a, a thick uh, outer layer, like a, uh, a conductive uh, insulating um, part of the wire, so it's keeping obviously the wire safe inside and uh, not to cause any harm to you. So imagine that protective um, outer of the cable no longer being there. Um, it can only be dangerous, obviously, in terms of electronics for us, but that signal may not be transmitted as efficiently. And it's the same with the auditory nerve. We have myelin. So myelin this is like a sheath that, um, that encompasses the auditory nerve. And, and sometimes that myelin sheath can... Um, not be there it could be worn away or completely absent which then affects the transmission of sound up the auditory nerve um, to the brain so it, it, the nerve doesn't fire in synchrony or as it should be anymore and there's other conditions like central auditory processing disorder which is an umbrella term really but it could be when the sound reaches the auditory cortex uh, or the brain itself um, the corpus callosum for example is unable to efficiently um, transfer speech from one hemisphere to the other and musical tones the, in the opposite direction or even if it can then that auditory cortex um, it may not be working as efficiently to process speech so there's many many things that can go wrong and um, so patients who, who suffer from uh, auditory dyssynchrony or um, neuropathy or central auditory processing disorder quite often they can present with normal um, hearing thresholds, hearing test results. And that's in part when you do a hearing test, it's simple tones that you're being asked to detect. Um, but speech is a lot more complex, especially in the presence of background noise. So the brain requires more, more processing than it does for simple tone, uh, tonal recognition. So patients can come in and they have normal uh, hearing test results, but then you do a speech and noise uh, tests and you see that they are really struggling in that because that requires more uh, more processing, more synchrony of the nerve firings. 
So for example, when I'm speaking at the moment, my voice has got different frequencies and the frequencies are presented in a specific ratio and order. Typically in words, you've got your consonant vowel consonant ratio. So the beginning of the words are typically consonants. The middle section is the vowels. That's what gives you the volume. And then you've got the consonant at the end of the words. The consonants are more responsible in giving the clarity. So when I'm speaking now, um, and for you to process my, my, my voice, your brain not only has to ensure all the relevant frequencies, um, uh, nerve fibres are, are activated, but they have to be activated in the correct order and in the correct ratio. So if your nerves are all firing but not in synchrony, then my voice is going to sound very muffled. Another way to, uh, probably a better analogy of that is if you're an orchestra and you've got all your different, and I'm not a, a, a I'm not an expert when it comes to orchestra, but you've got all your different instruments, your wind, your percussion, for example. And if they're all playing the song um, independently, it's going to be a bit of a mishmash. Um, and that's where you've got the conductor taking control, ensuring everything's in synchrony and in, in accordance. Um, and only then can you hear and appreciate the orchestra. Um, so think about speech like that. Uh, especially in background noise, because obviously that's another added layer of complexity. So your ears have got to make sure everything's been processed in the correct order, all the frequencies are correctly processed, uh, not only in the correct order, but the correct intensity as well. So there's a lot going on with our ears, guys. So yeah, um, central auditory processing disorder is something that's often overlooked. Um, um, there's exercises that can be done auditory, training exercise, lip reading can also help. Um, sometimes hearing aids with remote microphones can help. Um, so uh, it's, I remember an ENT always told me, never treat the audiogram, treat the patient. And I've, that's always stuck with me. So when, when we say audiogram is, is when we look at the hearing test results. Um, so you can have some with normal hearing test results, but they're complaining that they're not hearing. So You've got to treat the patient, not the hearing test results. So in the past, I have uh, prescribed hearing aids for patients. Um, and, and one actually left a really good review, uh, Dr. Chloe Guy. She's um, a, 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 a medical student at the time. Very, uh, she's full qualified now, but she was really struggling with her studies. And in the past, she was told that everything's fine, there's nothing's wrong. And, and she discovered me on YouTube and she visited me a few, it's quite a few years ago now. And uh, we diagnosed her with central auditory processing disorder. We fitted her with hearing aids. So these hearing aids weren't actually amplifying sound um, any louder because she was getting the volume. But instead, we attached what we call a remote microphone. So think about a remote microphone. It's the size of a matchbox and you clip it onto the person you want to talk to. So their voice is, if it's nearby to, their, to where they're speaking, it gets picked up by this remote microphone and via Bluetooth streams the sound into her hearing aid. So it's giving her what we call a better um, signal or speech to noise ratio. Uh, we want the speech obviously to be louder than the background noise. And uh, she used the, uh, the device um, very much so during her lecture. So she obviously imagine a big lecture room and it's a reverberant um, environment and she's really struggling to hear the lecture or even in award rounds. So she would give the remote microphone to the lecturer I mean, it could stream from quite a distance her particular one I think it's from 30 meters um, and also in the ward round she'd give it to the patients and it really revolutionized her, her career and it made a huge difference so um, she was she was only upset that obviously it wasn't diagnosed sooner um, but fortunately you know she's performed she's just doing extremely well in her career last time I spoke to her so it's brilliant to hear. So yeah, um, didn't really talk much about the procedure, but I just talk, thought I'd talk about the um, the ear a lot more um, and about hearing, because I know a lot of patients not only watch, um, or viewers, should I say, not only watch because of the wax, or in this case, a dead skin, but also because they're fascinated by the ear. So I thought I'd give you a little talk about that. There's there's so much more you can talk about. You um, can talk for hours and hours and hours but hopefully that made a lot of sense. And um, if not, then I apologise. <laughs> so 
uh, I'm just peeling away. So you may have noticed I've not used any oil. I just wanted to do this as a dry technique because, because it's a lot of skin and uh, the ear canal in particular, uh, the entrance, you can see it's quite narrowed. A few hairs with the oil, it would be very much likely to, to kind of, and we've happened before this patient, it, it smears the lens a lot and it's harder to see. So just through experience with this particular patient, I just decided not to use any oil because as I, as I mentioned, it just makes the visibility a bit harder. And, and again, if there's a bit of a fungal involvement here, then we don't want to be using the oil because the fungi can feed off it and exponentially uh, reproduce and grow. So, so we're nearly there. And you can see this here in particular, it's extremely itchy at the entrance. They were scratching away at it. So there's a bit of a scab there. So um, hopefully... I feel a bit better now. Yeah, it's just not possible to get every little piece of skin out. Um, so the patient's ear is already tender. And by getting a little bit of clarinetting as well. Right up against the eardrum at the top now, the roof of the ear canal. So you've got to be really, really careful. There's a few comments that you're always going to get them. And there's probably, they're all seal, serial offenders really, but... Uh, they, they moan about little pieces of wax here and there and you just think do you actually listen to the video and understand you know I know on on the screen it looks massive but the ear canal is less than a centimetre in diameter guys um, it, more often that's much much smaller so with the wax scope we've got some speculi which are 3.5 millimetres uh, or the that's the internal diameter but the external diameters would be if you incorporate the thickness of the wall of the uh, of the of the of the specular about four point seven mil, it doesn't fit in the ear, so we're having to stretch it um, and force the ear open. So that's all the skin keratin, as you can see, it's quite a lot. And guys, um, here is the response from Bishar to uh, many of you who have sent the email. Uh, just a few points. They've said that uh, because a lot of people have written similar, raised similar points that. Uh, some parts of the email will be similar to others uh, and they want to reply individually. I can confirm that's not true. This is the same email they're sending to everyone. Only difference is there's the name and that word not that I've highlighted in some of the ones, are they're not in caps. But it's not a problem, but you know, I don't think they should be saying to you and make you believe that it is an individual response when it clearly isn't. Um, I mean, they're saying here that their goal is to prioritise prioritize the safety of patients and it becomes apparent that these proposals do not align with achieving this they'll consider other options but i don't know how much more convincing they need they've got a whole host of emails from yourselves i give them the poll results i did last year you've got two other membership societies talking out against this multiple ent talking out against this you've also got the members i did a poll 95 percent of members who were against this on the previous page, I said there's been a lack of a spark of conversation about this matter. Well, I think the conversation has been ablaze for the last few weeks, if I'm honest, but they don't talk to the members. They don't liaise with us. It's very nice that they are contacting you guys back, but they don't talk to the members, um, the people that who they're meant to serve. So how can you have dialogue? So for me, I, I my gut feeling is, and keep sending the emails in, the email address is at the, in the description, please, and send me a copy as well. My email address is there. The more we push this agenda, the more likely are we are to get the change that we need to protect your ears. This is for you guys. Um, but I think there's a, a, an ideology there amongst some of the board members who represent the high street chain. So they, it's in their best interest because it's their business model. So why are they going to do a U-turn? So it'll be very interesting to see which way this goes. But again, I want to thank each and every single one of you from the bottom of my heart for supporting me on this. Um, it means a lot. And yeah, please continue to send the emails in. Be polite as well. Every email so far has been so well written eloquently and it's been very polite. So do continue with that, that tone and nature. It really makes a difference. Thank you, guys. Bye.